Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. I'm Anthony Cazenza, and I am not solo this week. I am joined by my usual partner in crime, Scott Schultze. Scott and I had a had an interesting pre-show conversation. We're probably not going to be talking about that on air, <laughs> at least not on this podcast. Maybe in a different, maybe if we create a different podcast, we can talk about it. But Scott, how are you? Uh, we missed you last week, and uh, I, I, it's my fault. I, I gave you late notice. I, I maybe wasn't going to do a show, and uh, it's actually the last calendar week I've been a little under the weather, so I wasn't sure if I was going to do it. And um, but I did one last week, and now we're together again this week. I missed you. How are how are you, man? Doing good. It was uh, yeah, it's very different. Last week I was actually out of town, so I would not have made it anyway. We were. No, there you uh, go. As I mentioned, my son loves trains, so we actually went to some dinky little podunk town uh, to sit at this park and watch freight trains go by because it's a great spot for watching. It's a very active, very busy set of train lines, and so if you love to watch, you know, just big, long, noisy freight trains go by, it's a lot of fun. If you don't, <laughs> I would not reckon there's really nothing out there. I mean, you're driving a long way to, in the middle of nowhere for nothing else. So, uh, yeah. So if we do a third podcast, we can do one on, on watching freight trains. On train. Yeah. So I, I was actually, I thought about you recently because uh, I, I started re-binge watching the show, The Office. I don't know if you ever watched the show. Um, fantastic show. And it's it just, it's still hilarious numerous times watching it through. But there's a specific episode where, if you know the characters, Scott, Toby, the, eight, the, yes. the dull yeah. HR rep, and Dwight, the eccentric salesman guy, um, they were spying on a guy they thought was maybe trying to take HR for a uh, workers' comp ride, if you will. And they were talking about trains, and they were like going back and forth on the specifics of what kind of train. And it was just—I think they only heard the the tooting of the of the actual engine mm -hmm. of the of the train. I'm like, oh, where's Scott? He's got to be. <laughs> he's got to be in the back seat of this car as these two guys are are chatting about uh, chatting about trains, and I'm sitting here going, I have no idea. But uh, it was kind of an interesting thing, and they were all, "Oh, you're into trains? You're into trains? I didn't know that." It was kind of an interesting thing. I'm like, Scott would love this scene. Where is this guy? Well, no, I have to look uh, it up on YouTube because we've gone through the whole season, the whole series, at least once or twice, and I cannot recall an episode where the two of them got along. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's an episode in like season five or six okay. where Daryl is uh, Daryl, the the warehouse guy, oh. is injured, and they're they're trying to to scope him out at his house. And as they're sitting in front of his house, they're having a conversation. They hear a train. Anyway, office the uh, nerds of the office will will probably know what I'm talking about. If not, then I probably sound like a lunatic, and that's okay. But we're gonna we're gonna do a question of the night though, Scott, and this was uh, based on. I guess an article, Cincy Jungle put it up, Cincy Jungle.com put it up, and uh, it was, I'm trying to think of who it was here, it was from, from uh, fanjuicer.com, and uh, our thanks to Patrick Judas on Cincy Jungle.com kind of promoting this, but it's talking about basically how NFL fans do not like the Bengals logo, and at this point, in 2017, 2018, they now use that striped B primary as their primary logo on a lot of different things that they have. So I wanted to put it out to you and to our listeners. I did put a poll out on, on Twitter uh, about your favorite Bengals logo. And what I had was the Leaping Tiger, which is kind of the entire tiger, if you remember that one. That was more early to mid-2000s. Again, kind of early to mid two thousands, and even it's kind of a secondary logo now. The tiger head, just the the face itself, and then there's the stripe B, or there's you know either if you got a different one you want to put out there, or uh, maybe you like just the old school 60s, 70s block lettering bangles mm -hmm. across the helmet. Scott, I'll ask you as we I, I'm going to tell you right now, the tiger head has a slight lead. On, in terms of our Twitter poll, has a slight lead, 35%. Uh, second place is the Striped B at 29%. 24% has the Leap, Leaping Tiger, and 12% has either other or none. I mean, they got to have a logo. I don't know why I put none, but that's midweek blues for my uh, – uh, so you're, you're just real quick, your thoughts on, you know, your favorite logo of the Bengals. I'm, I'm kind of curious. 
I mean, obviously, you and I have followed this team for a long time. I mean, heck, maybe even the striped helmet is something that's that's maybe your favorite logo. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, no, I've, I've, also, I've been following them since they've had the striped helmet, so I've seen clips of the you know bangle on the side. I've never actually I didn't actually watch them back then because I think they changed in '81, and even though I was alive, I was a little too young to really know anything about the NFL. <laughs> But I do like the striped helmet, and honestly, as far as the helmet itself goes, I think as far as NFL helmets, the Bengal striped helmet has always been my favorite helmet in the NFL. I think a lot of their ones are kind of generic. And even going to college, uh, I've seen it watching a ton of college football and NFL football growing up. The Bengal helmet's always been one of my favorites because it's very unique to sports, and it's something that actually is representative of you know the mascot. And it's it's you know whoever came up with that. And I don't know if the, the Bengals were the first team to have it or a college, you know, smaller college team did they copied from it. But I really like, you know, it's not a really, I've always really liked the helmet. I hope they never go away from it and go to words or like a little symbol. I like that it's the whole helmet represents, you know, that. So I, I think the helmet's really cool. As far as the logo itself, uh, my personal favorite is the leaping Bengal or leaping tiger. The I know there's ones where it has like the words behind him and the words below him or no Personally, I like the no words, but I, you know, either way, I just like the the tiger, you know, that attack aggressive kind of a pose. I'm not a big fan of the stripe B at all. That's probably my least favorite. I probably, you know, and as obvious as opinion. I mean, everyone has their own opinion. Some people listening probably think would put, there's totally backward of mine. One of the reasons I don't like a, the B, and this might be kind of silly, is it's also the Browns last name, Paul Brown, Mike Brown, you know, Katie Blackburn. So it's also seems like an attempt to try to get their initial, like, you know, B for, you know, the Browns, not football team Browns, but then the family owns a team. So I'd prefer to have like an actual object, you know, a shape of something, you know, a tiger head, a tiger paw, a tiger stripes, you know, something more than a letter because, and to me, the letter just seems kind of lame, but uh, I think a lot of people who grew up with the letter, you know, it's that's been around for over a decade. So some of the fa- people who are fa- newer fans or maybe, you know, are younger have only ever seen the letter. So that may be why they like it. Maybe I like this, the jumping, you know, the leaping tiger because they had that when I started following them, you know, when they were god awful. <laughs> but for whatever, and the funny thing is they, they had some awful teams when they had that logo. But I always, I've always liked that look. For whatever reason, it's it's a tiger. That's what they are. It's not a lame tiger. It's a cool, and I, I even like the the tiger at the very beginning. It's a the very cartoony kind of before they had the words on the side. If you ever seen a picture, there's like this kind of like running, almost like a Tony the Tiger kind of a tiger with a football, and he's doing almost like the uh, like a a run with claws or something. Like he's doing the whole fullback kind of thing. Uh, even that's kind of. I mean, I. Yeah, if they went back to that, did like a throwback thing for the 50 year anniversary, that would have been kind of cool. Obviously, it's too late for that now because you don't really do much for a 51st year anniversary. But yeah, long story short, the striped helmet I think is awesome. Hope it never goes away. And anything showing the tiger, uh, and even the one on Cincy Jungle, there's a really cool one for those who are listening to this who do not regularly visit Cincy Jungle. Uh, this is a plug for that site, which we both write for. And there is a very famous image on that site. It's kind of an inside joke image. There's a picture that always comes up on Cincy Jungle that someone drew that looks like they, you know, took like, a, you know, Microsoft Paint and tried to draw a tiger. And it's one of these hideous looking things that maybe a five-year-old would draw, but it's just really classic. I, I'd even take that over the, uh, the B. So that's my take. That one is hilarious, and I'm trying to pull it up. I did put <laughs> in, in the live YouTube chat, I did put out like a, a link to, I think it's on Pinterest of that. And, and Jason Von Stein in the YouTube chat agrees with you, Scott, about that old running tiger. He's got his helmets flying off, and he's got the ball yeah. in his hand. And yeah, it, it totally looks like 1960s, 1970s, like comic strip type of like what you'd see in the funnies in the old old school newspaper type of type of deal. And that is a, that is a classic one. Uh, I'm in agreement with you. I'm not a big fan of the B. I mean, it it, it, it has its moments where it's it's kind of cool and it, it looks pretty, you know, pretty unique and different to me. I, yeah, I like the leaping tiger and all that. To me, the face that, that that face of the tiger where it's real close up. That's that's my favorite. Um, 
pretty unique, pretty different. And I'm also with you, Scott, on the helmets. I think the helmets are very unique. And to be quite honest, when I was a young kid and my brother who got me into the, the team, when he was a young kid, one of the things that drew us in being six, seven, eight years old at the time were those crazy helmets, you know, the orange, the orange and the black and, uh, kind of kind of unique and, and kind of we just wanted to ask our listeners about that so if you have thoughts about that and you're joining us live throughout this evening on wednesday night uh let us know in the youtube chat let us know in the cincyjungle.com um comment thread or you can let us know on uh twitter at bangles obi real quick scott any changes you would make because right now as the Bengals use those quote-unquote color rush uniforms it's basically white and black unis, and which I think have their moments of looking pretty sleek. White and black unis with the orange and black helmet. Does that strike you as weird? Would you make changes there? Uh, I, I don't know. Any any uniform or logo variation you would do on the quote unquote color rush, which with white is what a lack of a lack of color, right? <laughs> yeah, there's. Uh... One change I would make, and I'm not the first person to say this, but it seems to be a very common theme. Anyone who's seen the color rush, it just looks kind of silly that the colors aren't all consistent. You have the black and white, and then you have the orange and black up on the head. I think the solid black and white would be, or I guess it wouldn't be solid if it's too, you know, the black and white helmet to go with the black and white uniforms, I think would be really cool because that way you've got like the whole entire, you know, Siberian tiger look. So that would be the one thing I think the you know, the color rush, some of the color rush, you know, look kind of silly on some of the teams. Some not so much. I do like the Bengals one because I do think the black and white is kind of a cool look and it is an actual tiger. I mean, there actually are tigers are black and white. So it's a really, it still goes with the theme really well. And it's just like a classic, you know, two very classic colors. And I just wish I'd take the orange off the helmet when they do. The well, color. well, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, but, Here's the thing: Bengal tigers are not normally white tigers, right? I mean, aren't aren't white tigers? I, and I'm not a zoologist or a biologist or anything like that, but I think that white tigers are a different species from a quote unquote Bengal tiger. So, I, I but I do see where you're saying let's 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 have the helmet at least match those uniforms. I mean, it, it kind of sticks out a little bit, but they got to have that spot of orange somewhere. Um, I wouldn't mind even more, you know, maybe. You reverse it a little bit. Maybe the uniforms that are primarily black, and you got the touch of white with the white helmet and the black stripes. I don't know. Um, they, they're, you know, maybe they could get a little more creative. But uh, I think for the most part, most of us are in agreement that the B is maybe. I, I, I did see Carlos Andre, and he did interact with us on Twitter as well. Uh, I did see him in the in the YouTube chat saying he likes the B, and and I, I get it. I mean, I, I think that there's. Definitely, uh, you know, a little bit of a, an attraction to that, and it's it's very different to other logos that the Bengals have held in the in the in the past. But uh, kind of an interesting conversation and a question of the night for this episode. Uh, so let us, and if you're if you're tuning in to this episode, let us know. Like I said on YouTube, on uh, Twitter at Bengals OBI or the the CincyJungle.com comment threads. Or you can let us know after the fact. If you're downloading this program, you can get this program and give us your comments on SoundCloud, you, uh, YouTube, CincyJungle.com, iTunes, uh, via email, theobinsider at gmail.com, and as I said, Twitter at BanglesOBI. So, Scott, let's get to some more kind of news and notes and or tidbits of information. Uh, I, I gave – one. Yeah, go – what? Just one thing I threw out, very last yeah. thing about the color, and you are mentioning, you know, how the – uh, the Siberian tiger, which is more Russia, uh, Siberia, you know, is the black and white tiger. The Bengal tiger is from the, you know, the, the Bengal region, the Bay of Bengal or, uh, you know, Bangladesh, which is the orange one. So, but even the Bengal tiger on the underside has the white and black. It's only like on the, the it's the orange. So, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, so I'm, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, that being said, and that's something too. They could do. they could make like the back side of the Bengals orange and the front side white. Well, I don't know. I just you could do that. I'd like to see a consistent color. It just looks kind of silly to have. It just looks like the helmets are out of place. Like they they left their helmets in, at the airport and oh crap. Let's okay. Well here let's grab these backup helmets. Or it just doesn't seem like it goes. And you think you'd have yeah, changed what billions of dollars could afford. 
Well, and if you if you look, if you remember what the Jacksonville Jaguar, not not the past year or two now, but they kind of had helmets that faded into a different color. Their jerseys kind of faded into different colors. So maybe that's something the Bengals do. And if there's one thing we know about the Brown family and the Cincinnati Bengals, they are on the cutting edge. They are super creative. This is – should I put sarcasm on here? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, for Yeah, I, they, they're not. Uh, they just kind of go with the flow and do their thing. Speaking of doing their thing, they're doing their things at to organize team team activities in the spring of, of 2018, and there are a lot of different news and notes and headlines. Last week, Scott, I talked a little bit about Carlos Dunlap sitting deciding to sit out OTAs, and now Drake Kirkpatrick is joining him. I kind of want to get your thoughts on both of those guys because I didn't get your thoughts on Dunlap this week, and now another prominent, basically a starter who already has a pretty prominent contract is sitting out OTAs. And I, you know, I, I think there, there's an argument to be made in terms of being in Dunlap's corner to talk about, you know, he doesn't want to get hurt in a meaningless practice in a contract year. And yeah, he's got some money coming his way. This doesn't necessarily mean he wants to not be in Cincinnati beyond this year, but we know that the OTAs, even though it stands for organized and they, it also stands for optional, I guess we kind of know it means mandatory optional. And I, I kind of want to get your thoughts on the, on both of these guys being entrenched starters and especially Kirkpatrick now, because that's new news this week. And because the Bengals invested pretty heavily in defensive back this year and William Jackson seems poised to take another starting spot, maybe even be the best corner cornerback on this roster your thoughts on both those guys skipping OTAs yeah as far as Dunlap I, I don't really have a problem with it because he I mean he's not a guy that's been a bad character guy he hasn't been a you know holdout guy he hasn't been one of these guys that's you know he's been a great player a great team player great teammate everything you read about him he's he, you know, he's been in the running for like you know the man of the year kind of stuff like he's just a very class person he signed a contract you know Several years back, before he kind of came into his own, they've had him for you know what five six years at a very reasonable price compared to the market. So you know you look at his perspective; he's a great player. I yeah, I don't think he's you know out to get anybody. He's just a great player. He's played well beyond um, what he's been paid over that period, and I think he knows that hey, this is my you know, my my shelf life. I want to be thirty next year. This is my chance to get get my money. I don't want to do anything silly and injure myself. And like you said, it is optional. And I think he's, he's making a, obviously him and his agent have gotten together and they said, okay, you know, by missing this, you know, workout, we are going to forfeit however much money with the, with the hope that by playing and, you know, waiting to play until preseason and the train, you know, training camp and the regular season and you know, skipping things before that to get to that point, I have a better chance of staying healthy and then therefore increasing my value for my next contract. And so I just look at it as, as a business decision on his part that they're you know, trying to weigh how much money can we sacrifice in fines and lost bonuses versus what we think we can get at a next contract, you know, trying to avoid injury. So, and I think he knows he's a starter. I think there's no question. I mean, it's not like we're going to say, okay, he skipped OTAs. He's now the backup. I mean, I don't see Marvin benching a starter. I don't see the, the Bengals doing that. He's a, he's a very proven player, a good player. Uh, regardless of what happens, he is the starter. I So with him, I have no objection. I mean, he's been a, a great class guy for the team, you know, in every on and off the field. The Drake Kirkpatrick one. Okay, now that one, <laughs> that one just really confused me because like you said, they just threw a ton of money at him last year, gave him a big extension, kept him around. And as you mentioned, obviously William Jackson, you know, uh, had a great second season after being injured most of his first year and then not getting to play the final few weeks when the team activated uh, Cedric Pierman off the IR return. So Jackson pretty much sat his whole first year. His second year, he was incredible. He obviously solidified his position as one of the two starters. Drake Kirkpatrick finally emerged, had a very solid year as kind of like their third cornerback. Uh, So the, Kirkpatrick thing I don't really understand because, you know, they're not going to pay this guy, you know, so many million dollars over that many years to not start him. 
And the Bengals generally aren't a team that's going to cut a guy with that much money invested in him. So I don't know if he's just trying to avoid injury or or with his stories. Because even if he gets hurt, he's still getting paid. So the Kirkpatrick one, I don't really understand. I can't imagine he's tr- holding out trying to get more money because I just I don't. I think they kind of overpaid. If you look at how the backups have played, you look at how well William Jackson's played. They still have him th- for three more years. Uh, yeah. So I I don't. I, I, I just, uh, you know, without tripping over my words, because I just can't think of a good word to explain why Kirkpatrick would not be an OTA, so barring, you know, something off the field, something internal that we just don't know about. So, I, you know, I'm kind of looking at a different number of items on Drake Kirkpatrick in terms of his salary. Uh, essentially with the, the new contract he signed a couple off seasons ago, he's getting paid ten and a half million dollars per year on average. And that's also on average is, uh, really like essentially his cap hit, um, this year, you know, the next couple of years are more in the 11 to 11 plus million dollar range this year. He's kind of more nine, five million, but. Overall, ten and a half million dollar average per year as a cornerback. That's number thirteen overall. That's the, that's the thirteenth highest paid cornerback overall in the NFL. And you know, you look at Josh Norman's the highest at fifteen million a year. Tremaine Johnson, Xavier Rhodes, Patrick Peterson. Obviously, these are guys that that do deserve to be paid more than Drake or, Drake or Patrick. Now. You look back at a couple of years, I think 2014 to 2015, Drake Kirkpatrick had some decent years. Um, last year was not a banner year for Drake Kirkpatrick. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill here. I, you know, he's being paid slightly more per year than Jimmy Smith, his AFC North counterpart in Baltimore. I tend to think Jimmy Smith, especially in recent years, is probably a better quarterback than Drake Kirkpatrick. I think Drake or Patrick could be a very good number two cornerback in the NFL. And I think that's probably where he's going to be with the Bengals because I think William Jackson, I think most of us can agree that based on what we saw last year, William Jackson is ready to step into that number one role. But I, I don't, I don't really, you know, aside from, I don't want to get injured and I don't want to, you know, we we saw the Steelers just on Wednesday they lost their backup offensive tackle, pretty, you know, relatively valuable guy, a tight end. I think I said last week, the chargers lost uh, Hunter. Uh, they're, they're, they're starting tight end. The guy who was replacing Antonio Gates and another player, uh, I think a line, uh, no, the Eagles linebacker lost. Uh, they, they both tore ACLs done for the year. Obviously you don't want your starters there in these meaningless practices in basically helmets and shorts. Yes. You want to learn new playbooks. Yes, you want to get, you know, all of that. But you don't want to see them done for the year in meaningless practices. But Dunlap, I sort of understand. Kirkpatrick, I don't. Um, You know, maybe he feels as if, you know, he's got things set up and he's he's good to go and he's got his starting spot. He's got his money, and that's that's that. Uh, I, I think he's got a lot of heat this year. And I don't want to say that fifth round picks, Devontae Harris and, and Darius Phillips are guys that are going to be pushing for his starting job, but you've also got Dark as Denard in the final year of his deal. Again, William Jackson really pushing to be the number one corner on this team. I, I don't really see where the mindset is. My thoughts, Scott, when you mentioned – Hey, maybe he's holding out for more money. If he is, he's crazy. (laughs) Based on what he's he's being paid in terms of average uh, salary per year, what he did last year, and the amount of corners that are on the Bengals roster right now, he's crazy if that's the thought. But I don't, again, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but it is notable that he's not there, right? Yeah, although I, okay. Okay, I thought I was on mute. I uh, guess I'm not. Okay. <laughs> one thing You're I not. We're here. Is, uh, and this was just an update pretty recently that he was 
not he's supposed to be at OTAs later this week, and he was out for a death in his family. So if that's the case, that could be the reason why. Because like, well, okay. like we were talking about, there's no other reason why he would be out. I mean, he has a huge yeah. contract. He got a ton of money last year, the way the contract paid him. It paid him a ton last year. This year's, uh, I think, down to eight mil- down to eight million, and the next three years are nines with uh, much smaller cap hits, which means the Bengals could walk away if they wanted to. But uh, yeah, if he's if he's back, you know, uh, tomorrow or whatever, and like this report says he is, and okay, that that makes sense. Yeah, that 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 stuff, and and you know, again, we don't know that much right now, but if if that's true, obviously. That stuff takes precedence over a lot of things in life, your job, whatever. I, I get it. And I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna rake him over the coals if that's what's he if that's indeed what he is missing OTAs for or practices for, obviously family and all that stuff comes first. So Dre, if you're listening, and we know you are because this is such an a popular podcast, we apologize if that's what it is. But it does make headlines. It, it was on CincyJungle.com. It's on Twitter. It's on all that stuff. I mean, it, it's known that he's not there. So uh, it's Dunlap on on social media. You would have seen that he has been kind of living it up in terms of vacations over the past week or so. Now, that doesn't mean he's not working out. There's some stuff showing that he's working out. But he's been on tropical vacations and all kinds of stuff and – you know, I mean, I guess he can afford to do that uh, in more way, in more senses than one. When I use the word afford, so, uh, <clears throat> but you know, it's just this, this is a use where you just want all hands on deck, especially what's happened the last couple of years. And these two guys who are supposed defensive leaders, again, we don't know what's going on with, with family matters and all that. That needs to obviously be take priority, but. If it's just kind of hey, I don't, I don't really feel like showing up. You know, I get that you want money. I get that you want, you, you know, to preserve yourself for the season, obviously. But Andrew Whitworth, I don't remember him ever sitting out OTAs, at least not for an extended period of time. And he's a guy that was there in his early thirties, mid thirties when he was with the Bengals, still there. I, you know, I, it just it kind of sets a tone a little bit, and. uh Interestingly, those are two positions that are very competitive this year. So we'll see what happens with that. But obviously, I, I think we, we we know that Carlos Dunlap and Trey Kirkpatrick will be safe in terms of their starting position. But at least at a minimum, other players are getting uh, a little bit of a look this spring as those guys are out of the lineup. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals pa- podcast. I'm Anthony Xenza. That's Scott Schulte. We are here almost every week, at least – when it, when it really counts, we'll be here every week uh, talking Bengals football. You can get this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, CincyJungle.com. You can also get in touch with us on, on uh, Twitter at BengalsOBI and via email the OB Insider at gmail.com. We hope you do that. And uh, we appreciate all the feedback that you guys give us. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our iTunes uh, channel. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and get all of our content and be, be sure that you are getting immediate notifications as our new stuff comes out, our new podcast come out because we want to get you the content as it comes out. We appreciate all the feedback. I don't want to talk too long about this young man, but Bobby Hart is a guy who's a backup offensive lineman and he, he recently came out with a comment and you can see this article on cincyjungle.com that he hopes to play 16 games for the Bengals and start 16 games for the Bengals. We talked a little bit last week when you were gone, Scott, about the offensive lines, switch certain switches, the coaching changes, all of that. Bob, uh, Bobby Hart is listed as a guard tackle on the Bengals roster as it, as it currently is. I mean, it, is he really far fetched in thinking that he could be on this team, the fifth, final fifty-three man roster, and potentially start or play in some capacity for the Bengals? Whether it's maybe even a jumbo tackle type of thing, or what have you, or have we seen enough from this guy? And you know, when he was with the Giants, and say, you know what, thanks, but no thanks. I'd say it's. 
I mean, on one hand, if you look at what he did with the Giants, the Giants were more than happy to get rid of him. They were, uh, yeah, pro football focus hated him. I think they rated him as one of the lowest uh, offensive tackles last year. The Giants, obviously, not, were not big fans of him. They let him go. A lot of the players were complaining, or at least some were, that he was uh, kind of a, maybe not cancer, but definitely not trying, uh, kind of an issue on the team. So, you know, look at how – and even Giants fans are like, yeah, this guy was just not very good last year. So all the indications are looking at how he played last year. He just was not a very good, very productive NFL player by NFL standards. Whatever measure you want to look at, whether it be your own team, your coaches, you know, outsiders, whoever it was looking at him, he just did not play well. That being said, there's two things going for him where he actually could, you know, someone who struggled that much could not only make the Bengals roster, but get playing time. The first one is we have a new offensive line coach who has had some very good offensive lines in Dallas. Now that being said, most of those guys were first round picks. They were high picks. So it's not like he's turning a bunch of undrafted free agents into studs. Uh, although Doug Free was not a first round pick, he did fairly well. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, you know, Tyron Smith, you know, all these guys were, you know, Travis Frederick were very high picks who were very good. So you have an offensive line coach who, in theory, could get this guy turned around. Uh, of course, he could also do that with the other guys on the roster who were here before Hart came here. The second thing going for him is the other guys on the roster. And I think that's the biggest thing that, you know, goes for Hart. And of all the places to land, you know, for someone like Bobby Hart, this would be a an absolutely wonderful spot because the boy he, in his two years as a starter, he struggled at right tackle two years ago, struggled at left tackle last year. I mean, horribly struggled. Jake Fisher, uh, did not look a whole lot better when he got in. Granted, he did have a health issue that has, you know, supposedly has been corrected, but you don't know if there's going to be any secondary effects from that. You know, maybe his play gets better, maybe it gets worse. That you, you just don't know. And then you have Kent Perkins as the other option. That's a guy who has played very little. He was an undrafted free agent. He looked good in, in bits and flashes in preseason, but of course that's preseason you know, against guys who are, you know, third, fourth stringers on the other team. So looking at his competition, there's not like, you know, it's not like he's going up against Willie Anderson or someone right tackle who's just right. an entrenched stud or even a, you know, this young promising guy. And they didn't even draft a guy. You know, they really didn't draft anyone uh, except for that very, very, very last round. Uh, you know, the kid out of Old Miss who can, uh, who's probably going to be a rotational backup. Yeah, at, Ron, Ron you know, Taylor, yeah. Yeah, who can play guard and tackle in some different spots. So, that's kind of probably the biggest thing going for Hart that really makes us not so crazy. What he's saying is that it's not like you look at this roster and say, man, this guy has no chance because of A, B, and C. You look at this roster and it's just like, man, you just hope one of these guys turns out to be, you know, at least league average NFL starter. Yeah. I, and here's the thing. You look at Bobby Hart when he joined the Giants back in 2015, okay? He he's played in 33 total games and started 21. All of those were at right tackle. Now, when you when you look at, obviously, he struggled at right tackle for the Giants, and the Giants really, if you, if you really want to pinpoint some of their struggles and Eli Manning's struggles, a lot of it rests on the offensive line play over the past couple of seasons. But this is, this is what may be a little bit of an ingenious thing for the Bengals and, and they're bringing in a Bobby Hart and they're talking about oh, offensive guard, offensive tackle. Same thing with Cedric Abwehi. Backup tackle is going to get reps at guard. Guys that emerge, it could be emergency guys at tackle, but may, because of their shortcomings, may be better fits inside a guard. And you talk, you see all these, when when the draft comes around, right? All of these guys who are great tackles in college, and they talk about short arms, they talk about athletic limitations, they talk about weight issues, whatever. And they're saying, well, this guy could be a better fit inside. You look at this is the, the, probably the most prime example is Robert Gallery. If you remember him, he was drafted in the mid two thousands. One of I think he was number two overall or something by the Raiders a guy who was an offensive tackle and struggled mightily as an offensive tackle, both on the left side and I think the right side for the Oakland Raiders, soon to be Las Vegas Raiders. But all of a sudden, 
the, the, the Raiders kicked him inside a guard. He was then brought over as a guard to, to the Seahawks with uh, Tom Cable, who was the former. And he had a decent career, actually a pretty above the average career at guard. Unfortunately, it was towards the end of his career with injuries and all that kind of stuff. It didn't really last that long. But there are guys who look the part of tackle in the NFL and, and show it in college and all of that. But for some reason, they can't, they can't keep up with the athleticism and the schemes and all of that that NFL defense has put out there. And they are just a better fit on the inside. So I personally – would not because again, I think we've talked about this on the past couple of episodes. Scott, center is going to be Billy Price. Left guard is going to be Clint Bowling. Left Cordy Glenn. That right tackle we think is probably going to be Jake Fisher. We don't know. A couple of guys are vying for it, including Abuehi, maybe Bobby Hart. And then that right guard position is wide open. I think more natural fits in terms of that true position. Christian Westerman, Trey Hopkins, all of those guys fit the mold. But if they've got a guy who kind of has a fringe athleticism at tackle, but has the size of a guard and can play guard, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe Hart's that guy. Well, I think the yeah, my, my complaint or problem with him playing, but. We can only have so many right guards, you know, with Alex Redman and uh, Trey Hopkins and Christian Westerman. And then if uh, Boyhe and uh, Bobby Hart become right guards, you know, we're going to have this problem. We have like five right guards and no right tackles. And I, and I totally agree that yeah, there are obviously yeah. cases where guys, you know, you kind of start on the outside and you kind of work your way in. Like, well, this guy wasn't good enough to be a, tackle let's slide him inside kind of like in baseball and their drafts coming up this week you know the idea is you're, you go for the center fielders and the shortstops and if they at some point they prove they're not good enough with their range their arm or whatever you slide them to second base you slide them to third base you put them in the left field but you kind of start with those so yeah you know, same with the offense you start left tackle or right tackle okay he can't cut it let's slide him into guard and the problem is man we have so many guys <laughs> we're sliding into this right guard spot you know you just have to hope that you know, if it turns out we have two right guards, hopefully one of them can play that tackle position because the thing I would hate to see is that, you know, we end up with, uh, you know, we come out of camp and, man, we have five guys who would be great NFL or solid NFL starting right guards, but not a single person that can play tackle. So I'm just hoping that somewhere along there they can find one of those guys, whoever it is, can play that right tackle because if everyone slides into guard with the uh, you know the three they have there unless they you know I don't know if this is crazy but maybe if someone like Hart and Abway he have to slide into guard maybe a Redman or a Westerman or Hopkins slides you know out the tackle which obviously is the more difficult transition to make and you know nothing you know really shows that they could do that but uh, I know Pollock's talked about you know ev everything starting fresh you know and uh, everything's up for grabs. So maybe he sees something in one of these guys that makes him think, Hey, this guy could be a serviceable tackle. And one of these tackles is better fit for that guard position. I just hope, hope we don't end up with a situation where we just have a ton of guards and no tackles. Yeah. No two tackles. Uh, I, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I do want to say this. I, I do not discount the Bengals from potentially making a, I don't want to say it necessarily a player trade, but post, Post June first cuts, which are right around the corner, uh, cuts during training camp. There could be tackles and stuff that are that are available there. Uh, we've seen them made make late off season additions like Eric Winston and stuff who have come in. Granted, Eric Winston was at the very tail end of his career, but um, you know the, he he did contribute on some level. Again, at least that right side with with bubble gum and tape and glue and all that kind of stuff. Maybe a, a veteran journeyman. Who knows? It could be Hart, veteran journeyman. But uh, you know, I do not discount the Bengals perhaps making one of those signature moves, especially ones that do not count against the 
compensatory draft formula because that's obviously something that they they pride themselves on keeping. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. I'm Anthony Kazenza. He's Scott Schultz. You get the program on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, at CincyJungle.com. Subscribe to all of those channels, and you can get the program as well on CincyJungle.com as well as uh, all of the other platforms I mentioned, and you can get in touch with us via email, theobinsider at gmail.com, and on Twitter, at BengalsOBI. Thanks so much for your uh, questions and all that. We're going to get to that in just a second. Just real quick thoughts here, Scott, on Andrew Brown, the rookie defensive tackle. For those who don't know, Andrew Brown's a really interesting guy, and he recently sat down with Rebecca Toback at CincyJungle.com for an exclusive interview. Um, I, I, I don't want to go through all of it, but go to Jungle.com to kind of get some of the nuances of that nuances of that interview obviously he's going to be a guy that is going to be not only vying for a roster spot but a guy who's going to be vying for playing time and i want to get your thoughts on that as well but for those who don't know brown's kind of an interesting guy he's he's very passionate about music he's done a couple of different things and uh again in this post on cincyjungle.com you can get some of his music on there um, the other thing is his, his mother was 38 years old when he passed away, uh, battling lupus, rheumatoid arthritis and, and breast cancer. Uh, unfortunately he was 10 years old when his mother passed away again at 38. And, uh, he is using that as a reason, reason, why, reason why, why, I do, why I do this. Quote, so, so pretty, pretty, uh, again, sad, 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 bad, bad, cool that like he is honoring his mother's memory and using the NFL as that platform. So pretty cool. Uh, and, and just a really neat story. And unfortunately, you know, some of this stuff kind of gets overlooked again. He's a fifth round pick. So some of this stuff doesn't get talked about as much as the first round picks, the second round picks. So check that out. I just, I, I guess, your thoughts, Scott, on Andrew Brown. The Bengals drafted Ryan Glasgow, a guy that they like as a defensive tackle. They have Geno Atkins. They have Andrew Billings. Uh, I think Andrew Brown makes it and could be a very, very decent contributor to this team as a rotational guy. You know, they they flirted with Deshaun Williams. They flirted with. Uh, you know, all kinds uh, Marcus Hardison, all these guys, and they didn't work out. I think this guy might be a, a diamond in the rough in the fifth round and a guy that they could use this year. What do you think? Yeah, I think there's definitely a possibility. And the one thing you notice the most when you watch it, go back and watch his film when he was playing in college, is that they tended to play him all over the place. They he didn't really seem to have a home. I mean, they played him inside some, they played him outside, they played him on the you know, left side, the right side. It wasn't like you're, you know, you're a three technique and that's what you're going to be, which seems to be the spot that he's probably the best fit for kind of like a Gino Atkins backup kind of a guy. He's not your nose tackle. He's not your, you know, speed edge rushing defensive end type. He's more of your guy that uh, seems to be that penetrator from the inside. And it's just very interesting to see that for whatever reason, uh, the team you played for in college kept moving him all over the place and, Either they were trying to maximize him or just couldn't figure out where to put this guy. And so I think that may have caused him to drop a little bit in the draft because when teams were trying to evaluate him, there just wasn't enough tape to see him in any one spot to see what he could or could do or couldn't do. So I have to assume the Bengals are going to use him at that Geno Atkins spot. And as you mentioned, Anthony uh, Ryan Glasgow is kind of another guy who is in a similar role. And then obviously the – uh, Baker, who they just signed from Tampa Bay, is probably also in that role. He's not the – although they, they'll, they, I assume they'll line him up next to Atkins, even though he's not like the big body, uh, you know, Andrew Billings, Pat Sims kind of a guy. It's like that 330 build. Uh, and it kind of makes you wonder, well, maybe is that something Tara Austin would go away from having that true, that big, you know, that D'Amato Pecco, like we're just going to have this big guy that clogs the middle and then this fast, you know, this – the very active guy next to him. Maybe they want to have two guys that can disrupt and not have that one big body just kind of sitting there. And if that's the case, yeah, it's very likely they could have two of those guys side by side, 
which is kind of, I think, more what Baker is supposed to be. He's more of a penetrator than a guy who's just kind of big. Like when they, you know, got Sam Adams, you know, a few years back, it's just, okay, you just kind of stand here and absorb half this line because you know, you're five feet wide. Uh, so there's also a chance that depending on what Tara Austin wants to do, that they might look at uh, trying to get him on the field with, uh, you know, some of these guys. And it might sound crazy, but they maybe they're looking at doing something with uh, a couple, three technique guys at the same time or uh, shift, you know, kind of moving the, the pieces of the line all around because they did lose Chris uh, – Smith, who was another guy who was very good as a pass rusher on the inside. So, yeah, I think the, the roles are kind of wide open. And until we uh, see them in preseason, it's hard to gauge exactly how they see them. I mean, for all we know, they might see Lawson as more of a drop back linebacker since they haven't linebacker, or maybe they're like, no, that's ridiculous. He needs to be on the line of scrimmage and be in it. So there's, I think there's a lot of uh, positions up in the air as far as how they're going to get you. So, until we see otherwise, I think this guy does have a good chance to to at least fight for a spot. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting. The Bengals uh, had an undrafted free agent a couple of years ago named David Dean, who also came from Virginia. Kind of a similar mold where, you know, in that 6'1-ish, 6'3-ish type of range in terms of height, 290-ish in terms of uh, weight, and a guy who could penetrate, a guy who could get in the backfield. David Dean, obviously, I think a lot of people think is was, no offense, David, but less talented than, than Andrew Brown, less athletically gifted. And Andrew Brown had uh, quite quite a bit of a college resume, but old there. And obviously, the you know the Bengals are looking for guys that can get in the backfield. You mentioned Chris Smith. I think Sam Hubbard is going to be filling in that role. But, you know, I think Carl Lawson's going to be ro roaming around, Carl, uh, Carlos Dunlap and Michael Johnson, who, like it or not, uh, is going to be a guy who probably is going to stick around and found a niche last year rushing from the inside. And then, uh, you know, I, I think the Bengals have – it's always good to have options when it comes to rushing the passer. And I think the Bengals, especially with guys like Joe Flacco, Ben Roethlisberger, potentially even Baker Mayfield and or Tyrod Taylor, a mobile guy, you know, you got to get those guys down before they make plays, whether it's with their legs or their arm or, you know, respective quarterback. You got to get those guys down. You got to pressure them. You got to hit them. And I think the Bengals know that. And I think a guy like Andrew Brown could do that. I don't know if his upside is bigger than Ryan Glasgow. To me, Ryan Glasgow might be just more of a – a guy who can, you know, stop the run a bit and, and do some things. Now, it is interesting that the Bengals aren't getting – they do have their big guy, their 330-pound guy in Andrew Billings, essentially. Uh, but they have other guys who are in that 300-pound range, not the big – they have Josh Tupo as well, but who knows if he's going to stick on the roster based on an offseason arrest and him bouncing on and off their team last year. Who knows? Uh, and he's a he's a mammoth. He's like 340, 350. But uh, I think the Bengals are going to get more of those athletic guys that can get in the backfield one way or the other, uh, use leverage, aren't necessarily the gigantic space eaters that a Pat Sims or an Andrew Billings were. Um, you know, and, and they're going to mix things up. And that's okay. Uh, you know, I think, you know, Terrell Austin's going to do some things to create more big plays, and we'll we'll see uh, we'll see what's what happens there. Hopefully positive results are netted. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. Again, I'm Anthony Cazenza. He's Scott Schultz. Thanks so much for all of your support. We're going to get to a couple of listeners of here. We did get to a little bit of a late start tonight. I apologize, but we did get a couple of interesting listener questions and we'll get to those. You can get to this pro you can get this program downloaded on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and cincyjungle.com. You can get in touch with us as always on Twitter at Bengals OBI and via email the OB Insider at gmail.com. Or uh, you can also, you know, get in touch with us uh, in the comments and, and all of that during our, our podcast. Again, email, YouTube, all that stuff. We have a live YouTube chat that goes on throughout the show. So uh, check that out. I hope you enjoy this program, and we, we love having you. Join us live every show. 
normally we're, we're basically here every week, but uh, off season, we, we may take a week off here or there, but uh, for the most part, we're here every Wednesday night. So check us out. We hope you enjoy the program. Let's get to a couple of listener questions. And Scott, this is both a listener question and, and a topic that is of hot debate in recent weeks. I don't want to make this entire program about this topic and I don't want to make this show political, but I was going to get to it last week in terms of the, the kneeling issue, quote unquote, uh, the NFL kind of whatever you want to say, the NFL putting the hammer down on its players, the NFL succumbing to the white house, uh, the NFL succumbing to financial pressure, uh, viewership about the kneeling during the national anthem. Again, I don't want to make this overly political, but this is a major, major thing in the NFL landscape. I've been asked about it off air. I've been asked about it on air. I've been asked about it from friends and all of that. Your thoughts on the NFL's new rules on kneeling and the national anthem and all of that, did they get it right? Do they have any idea what they're doing or are they just kind of throwing up stuff against the wall and see what sticks? It's, I mean, it's really hard to say. I mean, this issue goes back, you know, it seems to have been something where the NFL really hasn't been sure how to handle it. And I think part of the problem is because you do have the union and so there's certain – uh, things you you can only go so far and you have to have all the teams buy in that yes we do support this rule or we don't and then it also has to be something that is part of the collective bargaining agreement that doesn't violate you know what the union signed and the team signed and so it's a very so you can tell they're trying to make a compromise where they're not trying to step on anyone's toes and I think at the end of the day the biggest thing is you know the the protest you know right or wrong uh, it seems that obviously when Colin Kaepernick started it and then his teammates and then some other people joined along, initially it was supposed to be this, you know, he perceived that there was a, a race inequality issue as far as, you know, how uh, police officers treated minorities in this country. Uh, but for what, for a litany of reasons, it kind of grew into a much bigger issue as far as, you know, disrespect the flag, you know, soldiers and so forth. This is an offensive issue. Is it not an offensive issue? Is it a second or first amendment issue? And somewhere lost in there is this whole reason that he was, you know, doing this protest. The whole point of that seems to have been totally over, uh, you know, glossed over is now the focus tends to be on this other thing, which is, can they do this? Can they not do it? Is it right to do it? Is it offensive? You know, so also ultimately some people are going to find it very offensive, you know, for various reasons, like, you know, Trump has tweeted, you know, his reasons and, and he's not alone. I mean, viewership has gone down quite a bit. I think anyone who watches the NFL knows people who have stopped watching it for this reason, because they did find it offensive. Other people don't find it offensive. They're like, yeah, whatever. I really don't care. I think the NFL clearly does not want to lose the people who were offended. They don't want to lose revenue uh, so they're going to do whatever they can to try to bring those people back. And I think this is probably a, you know, the whole point of the NFL is to make money. This is an attempt. Clearly they need to uh, get viewership back, get it to increase. You don't do that by driving people away. So if you don't have the protests or you don't show them because they're protesting and basically out of sight, out of mind, uh, you can kind of get around it. You can let the players do what they want to do. If they want to protest, not protest, you can let them do their thing. Yeah, you know, the viewers aren't upset because the cameras aren't focusing on these players kneeling because they're not out there. I, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really solve, you know, it doesn't really get to the issue, which I think ultimately, I don't think it was supposed to be about kneeling or not kneeling. It was supposed to be about, you know, the police, the minorities and so forth. And of course, that's the thing that's kind of forgotten because the, uh, you know, the focus is kind of gone from what the whole point was to the kneeling or not kneeling. So I, It'll be interesting to see, you know, once we get a month into the season, we'll kind of see if, you know, players find another way to protest, if it just kind of boils over. And of course, every time uh, Donald Trump says something, that'll make things worse because, you know, the country is clearly divided. Half the people, you know, roughly yeah. voted, voted for him, half didn't. So th there's going to be a number of players who don't like him, who didn't vote for him, who are going to do whatever they can to 
you know, stir more things up, you know, but find a way to do that. Uh, so I assume like most issues, eventually this will blow over. Uh, currently it's obviously not. And, you know, these kind of half-hearted measures to try to fix things, I don't think are going to be sufficient. I think when the next CBA comes up or before then, they, the players and the teams just have to get together and say, okay, let's just all sit down. We're going to lock kind of like what the, you know, Catholics when they have like the Pope, they all the cards lock themselves in the Sistine Chapel. They lock the door from the outside and they're like, you guys do not come out until you elect the Pope. They need to do that with the NFL and the players union. Just lock them all in a, you know, somewhere, find a room, lock them in and say, you guys aren't coming out until everyone agrees. This is what we're going to do. And everyone's cool with it. We're not going to pick something where these people like it and these people don't, because you're just going to get more of the same where, uh, some people are going to be happy and some are. And of course for the media, it's a, it gives, you know, they're going to keep covering it until it dies down because it sells and, uh, you know, bleeds, yeah. it leads. And, uh, yeah. So I don't know if I really answered the question. I think I just rambled. <laughs> no, I, you know, it, it's good. I, I, I want your point of view and uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sitting here saying, Hey, be super PC, but at the same time, this isn't a political podcast. It's a Bengals podcast, but it does this, this, this rule change and everything affects the Bengals and, and this entire thing affects the Bengals. We talked a few, I think a couple of months ago before the draft, when the Bengals brought in Eric Reed as a possible, uh, you know, guy that they could use as, as a safety and he's a talented player and he has yet to find a job. And the Bengals straight up asked him about, and Mike Brown asked him about his kneeling and he was one of those guys on the forefront. So obviously this is, not only an NFL thing, but it's, a, you know, a Bengals thing. And a couple of players, I think it was George Loca and maybe a couple of others have spoken up about their thoughts about the kneeling. You know, I don't want to go into a, into a whole bunch of things. I, and I, I don't mean to be a resident fence writer. I, I see arguments on both sides. I really, really do. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> I kind of go back to this is the National Football League, America. Uh, you're playing an American sport, and I mean, I don't know. I, I, I kind of just am like, maybe show that bit of respect, and and you can do other things to promote. I don't want to say an agenda, but promote something that you are passionate about, whether it's uh, police issues or what have you. I have relatives who are police officers. I've been in. I, I, for those who know me and know this show, I've also had a relative that has been involved in gun violence. So I, I'm kind of on both sides of the fence there. So, I mean, I, I, I see a lot of ends of the spectrum here and there's a lot to dissect. I don't, I don't want to get into the whole thing, but it is very interesting. The bank, the, the, the NFL essentially have kind of, has kind of, I don't want to say bowed, but kind of, went with the white house if you will about certain things with the national anthem and uh, you know i i don't know how that's going to be received overall that this is and this is this has been with trump's presidency whether you're with him or against him or indifferent i don't know what to believe you know you, you hear things that the nfl is not doing well and the ratings are down the money's down the owners are feeling pressure and that's why they did this because they're feeling financial pressure uh, but then you also see other reports that ratings are up and you know this isn't accurate so i don't i don't know who to believe about this and, and i'm i'm gonna go literally with one of our great listeners and uh, in Michael Myers, and what he wrote in our YouTube chat. He wrote, this is America, if you want to kneel, fine, but if someone doesn't agree and decides not to sign you, then that's their choice, just like it was their choice to kneel. I served for 21 years, and yes, it upsets me, but again, the best thing about this country is to kneel, you want. First of all, Michael, thank you for your service. As, as I didn't know you, you know, we didn't know that you served in the American military. So thank you so much for your service. And that's kind of where I think, to be honest with you, I, I you know, I know there's people that are very passionate that are anti uh, police and all of that. And I, I, I can understand with some of the extremism and the videos and stuff that has been out there. And I can understand the other side. 
I think that's where a lot of people are. You know, you have the right to choose whether or not you want to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. You have the right to choose to do what you want, but this is also America, and there are a lot of people who have died and or served for this country, and they do see that as a bit of a sign of disrespect. I think there's both sides to the coin. I, I, I don't know if you remember, Scott, there was a thing five, ten years ago where certain people were not – saying the word God in the Pledge of Allegiance in classrooms and uh, business settings or what have you, and that caused a stir. And I, I kind of think that this is more of a, another offshoot of that a little bit where people are just kind of like, well, you have the right, but not just so you know, not every, just because you have that right, not everybody's going to agree with you either way, right? Yeah, I uh, always have to make sure my mute is on uh, or off. <laughs> but yeah, and I think that's the thing too that uh, you know, it, I think if you go back, you know, two three years before any of this even started, if you asked your average fan what they were doing when the national anthem played, I mean, usually they didn't even see it on TV. I mean, because you're you know walking around, you're in the you're in the bathroom, you're in the kitchen. Uh, yeah, so most people would not have noticed it because when they show it, you know. It's not like, you know, how many fans at home took off their hat, stood up in front of the TV during the anthem? I might be some, I assume it was very, very few. And even in the stadium. Well, I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I, in, the, in, the stadium, in the stadium, I do. If I'm in the stadium, I do. And yeah, I do but at yeah. home. I, no, no. I, I, to be honest, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the stadium, you know, the people who are in the seats do. But a lot of people are in the bathroom. They're getting – you know, beer, they're getting a hot dog. Some right. of them might pause for a moment, but some still keep doing their business as the vendors are still selling them food. And, you know, if, if no one had ever said, hey, this guy's kneeling, most people probably would have never noticed because you see people kind of moving around all the time and there's people going in and out of the tunnel and people tying their shoes, you know, grab you know, the ball boys are getting balls. And they're, you know, it's more, it's kind of like, you know, um, if you go to church, you know, some people, there's certain parts where people are generally more reverent. But you still have people doing things. They're still doing their lives. And uh, so, yeah, I don't think you would have, um, you know, anyone would have ever really noticed one way or the other. And uh, kind of like with the pledge, too, it's, yeah, I mean, people uh, are going to, I mean, we have, uh, what, hundreds of millions of people in this country. And, you know, I don't think they all have voted for one candidate ever because they have very right. different views. <laughs> you know, some people think the country's too far left and too far right. And same with football. You know, they, you know, some people are going to say, well, get, you know, I don't want any politics in my football. Just give me football. Yeah. You know, I'm paying this money not to get all this stuff. I don't want the CNN or Fox or whatever. I just want football. And everybody like, well, no, you know, they have a right. They, you should let them. And you, I mean, you see that it's hard to get right. Cause even things like, you know, the Tim Tebow thing, where like on the eye black, he put like, you know, what first Timothy three fifteen or whatever he had on there, uh, Philippians or, and the yeah, people do that too. When they do, you know, their touchdown dance or kneel or, you know, whatever they do the little, you know, sign the cross before they bat. Some of the players do. And here's different, you know, things that like, like you see either it's religious or political or, you know, spiritual or there's something, uh, that people are doing that, uh, you know, you can avoid if you want to, and obviously not everyone's compelled to join in. I mean, obviously, if Tim Tebow scored a touchdown and you know someone points to heaven, you don't have to point to heaven with them. You can just kind of sit there and clap or do nothing. And but yeah, no, that's one of the things that's, I think is very cool about this country is you look at somewhere like North Korea or China when they have these big military parades and they bring in all the missile launchers and all the tanks and all the soldiers are kind of marching through that you, you are expected to behave a certain way. You have to stand, you have to salute, you know, everyone in the audience has to come dress a certain way, you know, act a certain way. You don't get to be an individual. You, you don't get to be who you are. And that's kind of one of the cool things about, you know, the NFL, you can come, you can dress up like a moron, you can drink a bunch of beer and yell, you can just sit there on your hands and you can politely clap. You can, you can do it. it you, there's a lot of variety. There's a lot of options and a lot of freedom to do, you know, kind of your thing. And that's, uh, you know, one of the cool things about this country is that you are allowed to, you know, kind of govern yourself to a degree and decide how you want to behave and do what you want to do. And so some guys may want to kneel. And, and one that, not to go off on a tangent, but one of the other things is that, you know, kneeling actually is a sign of reverence. I don't think he was kneeling as a sign of reverence, but, you know, in some cultures and even in this country, kneeling is something you do instead of, uh, 
you know, standing. I mean, some people, you know, here comes a judge, everyone stands, you go to church, some people kneel. They kneel before a crucifix or before they pray. Is it because it's a reverent thing? You see a knight when he gets knighted, he kneels before the king and he drops a sword on him. It's you know he's not protesting the king; he's kneeling before him. So, uh, yeah, there's many different ways. Of, again, I think I'm rambling, so I will turn it back over to you. No, and, 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 you know it's good. It's good because it, that's that's what this topic elicits. It elicits conversations and it, it, it elicits a lot of different things. You know, I don't want to go too much further into it. We've got one more quick question, and then we'll get out of here, but. I will say this, you know, both family and friends on both sides of the fence, like, I'm, like I said earlier, I have cousins who were passionate about football, and when I've seen them recently, I was like, oh, yeah, we've been watching well. But they're like, well, how's everybody doing? I don't know. I, I kind of boycotted the NFL because of the kneeling thing. Okay. And then I have family members who are also police officers, but I also have friends and family members who are on the opposite side saying, well, you know, I totally get – what they're doing. I totally understand what they're doing and I totally support what, what they're doing in terms of a quote unquote protest or whatever you want to call it. So, you know, there, there, I, I have conversations on both sides of that fence. Um, I will say this. I think that, uh, you know, if, if I were to be a professional athlete and everything, I would stand for uh, that's just me i would stand for the pledge of allegiance and the national anthem and and do that uh do i agree with everything that's going on with this country and and its political landscape and its social landscape absolutely not i don't this isn't necessarily the platform to talk about that but uh, you know that there are many issues uh, across this this country and i still think that it is the greatest country no offense to those of you who are across the pond and in other countries that listen to us. I'm sorry. I still love the USA, but I, I, I think I live in the greatest country in the world. That doesn't mean that it's not without severe problems. So that's, that's my thing. And my, my concern is with this, where's the line? And with, with many other issues, where's, where's the line and where does that line stop? Right. I mean, you know, in the Olympics, there are guys, you know, when, when men or women win medals, they're out there and they're representing their country. And wh where does the line stop? And that, that's, that's my concern. And I, whether it stops or where it begins or wh whatever the, whatever you want to say about it, that's, that's my concern is, you know, a year from now, what are we going to be talking about in terms of, political landscape or social landscape or all of that. I, and it's not just about football. I just, I just worry about what we're going to be talking about. And I think so many people are so passionate on one side or the other in terms of politics and social issues and all that. And that's okay. You, you should be passionate about your life, lives of others and all of that. Totally. But that, that there's that. And then there's also the faction of people that get, I hate to say it like this, but r get rather offended about a lot of different things. And then other policies and other things are, are brought forth. So I just worry about this becoming a thing where, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could, you can demonstrate how you want during the national anthem, but where are we going from here? And then what's next? And then what's next? And then what's next? And is this not, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I think there's, maybe I'm, I'm totally leapfrogging everything, but uh, I, I just, I wonder where all of this is heading. And uh, I wonder if it's heading, if it's heading towards a positive direction or if it's heading towards more divisiveness, which, which I don't want. And uh, I think most people would agree that they do not want more divisiveness, whether it's about this topic or other topics. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. I'm going to take a deep breath and uh, let that one percolate with everybody. And hopefully we didn't offend you, but hopefully we got you talking, we got you thinking about a number of different issues, not only in the political landscape, but in the NFL. This isn't a political podcast. It's a Bengals podcast. And uh, we hope – you bore through that question. We've got one more quick one before we get out of here. I hope my co-host will stick with me on this one. Scott, we were asked about Richie Incognito and the Bengals. 
Richie, uh, let's let's go from one controversy and you know let's just let's just keep going. Uh, you know, obviously we all know about his bullying thing in Miami, and then he kind of rejuvenated his career. Was a Pro Bowl player in Buffalo. Randomly, kind of retired this year. Yeah, he's up there in age, but you know, was still playing at a high level. Decided to retire. And now there's some talk about him coming back. A lot of people are saying, hey, should he come back to the Bengals, maybe play right guard for them? He played right guard primarily in the early part of his career, mostly left guard at the end of his career. Good move, smart move. I I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I mean, there's obviously two ways to look at it. One is, you know, Richie Incognito, the person. And there was the whole thing with Jonathan Martin. And a lot of people speculate, well, was he really over the line or was Martin just really soft? Because there were some other issues with Martin. I think he'd – had tweeted something about, you know, being suicidal or something. They were just, so that whole thing has some issues. And the thing you, you know, without being in the locker room with him, it's hard to know, okay, is this guy just a basket case kind of crazy guy? Or is he just a, you know, a regular guy and Martin just took it away. And then you have the, obviously the football perspective of it and the football perspective. He could, as you mentioned, he is a little older. He could be an upgrade for possibly a year or so. The reason I would be against it uh, without knowing what he's actually like off the field or in the locker room, just, you know, I think many people speculate because of different things that have happened, but it's hard to know, you know, when you're on the outside looking at it, it's so hard to be able to accurately speculate those kind of things. You know, is this guy crazy? Is this guy wonderful? Is he whatever? But the thing we can see is you look at the football field and what we see there and kind of hit on this earlier is the Bengals seem to have a, potential glut of right guards and i'm not sure the best situation for this team is to add one more in the mix because with westerman redmond hopkins you know last year at right guard uh a way he possibly sliding in bobby hart we talked about sliding in uh you know gardner the guy for uh, they draft in seventh round this year possibly being a, a backup you all of a sudden have just so many you know you've got like a you know almost a ton worth of right guards all trying to squeeze into that one spot. And then, you know, in that mix, does someone like Cognito, you know, and now if Cognito was like an all pro stud, like, yeah, this guy's, of course you do. You, you having a glut of solid mediocre, mediocre guys doesn't, shouldn't prevent you from grabbing an elite player. But if he's not that great step up from what they have, then I'm just not sure how it works with, all those guys that have, unless he can play right tackle, which he probably, you know, is not a right tackle. So I'd, I'd, I'd be inclined to be against it just because it, that's just a ton of guys to throw at one spot. So here's, here's the thing, Scott. Four time Pro Bowler. He, oh, so he entered the league in 2005. Okay. With the Rams, he played there for five years. Then he played for the Bills again in 09. And then, or initially with the Bills in 09, with the Miami Dolphins from 2010 to 2013, and then with the Bills again in 2015 through 2017. He made the Pro Bowl. Now, that the Pro Bowl isn't the end-all, be-all of barometer of success and, and productivity, but made the Pro Bowl in 2012 and then 2015 through 2017. Essentially, every year he was with the Bills the second time around, 2015 through 2017, and one of the later years with the Dolphins after all this stuff kind of came out. Now, if you've been paying attention to some of the stuff in the news, Incognito kind of was like arrested at a gym or was being just ridiculous. I, my my thing is with him, he's a mess in terms of mentally. I, I, I he's a guy. If you're a player and all of that, he's a guy you probably have in a locker room. You're like, this guy's hilarious. He's a total meatball. He plays well. He plays hard. Probably eats like meatball parm sandwiches for breakfast. You know, like just a total total guy that you're like, this guy was born to play football. However, he's a loose cannon. And he was not necessarily a loose cannon in Buffalo, but he was a loose cannon in Miami. He's, he, he just proved himself when he wasn't playing football, he's a loose cannon. To me, Richie Incognito, talented guy, probably still has some talent, even though he's probably going to be – he's 34 years currently, going to be 35 after July 5th. To me, that's a guy that is a 
you know, your right guards get hurt, your tackle gets hurt, and that's a guy you bring in late in training camp, or you bring him in even if those guys aren't hurt, and you say, hey, these are it's a guy that's going to just compete for a spot, give him some money, see if he can do it, and and you know, if you feel like you're pretty close in terms of a playoff push. I don't think that, um, you know, I, I, maybe maybe you go that route. But for me, I think this is a, a deal, move in desperation, and and go from there. Otherwise, I say maybe look elsewhere. Right, Scott? Yeah, I uh, would have to agree. I don't think it's a, a need. It's okay if I'm not right. It's okay if you think I'm not right. No, I, I agree. I mean, what I kind of said earlier, I don't think it's, I mean, unless they think this guy is going to come step in and be, you know, so much better than anything they have. I mean, if, if you think he's a clear step up in talent over, you know, the six or seven right guards you have, then you absolutely bring him in because he is a, but if you think, no, he's older, he's just, he's a issue on the field, off the field, he's not worth it. He's not that great. Then, I'd say, no, you have enough right guards. You wait, you see what preseason, what OTAs bring. If everyone comes out healthy, if you have some guys get injured, you don't know, you know, what other teams are going to cut. Maybe someone else signs them and drops another guy you like better. Uh, so yeah, I'd say at this point, uh, there's not a need unless, you know, Frank Pollock looks at this roster and he's like, Oh my gosh, you know, I, I can't do anything with this. And so, yeah, at this point it's, it's, I think it's too early to tell if, unless the you know the new coaches think that uh, we don't have anyone comparable to what this guy can bring. And then the question is, well, if if he is that good, when it's someone have signed him by now? Which is kind of the thing you hear same with like Des Bryant. That's the whole thought of hey, if Des Bryant's that good, someone's had to have signed him, right? Well, it's 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 the I'm, I'm assuming it's a matter of risk versus reward and cost versus demand, you know, what they're demanding, all of that. I think that has to do with, with all of that. But you're right. You're right. And to me, I mean, I, I look at – and I don't – I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but I'm, I'm looking at some of the comments in the YouTube chat. Um, <clears throat> I think it was uh, – I, I can't remember who it was, but – Essentially, there there are signs, especially with his recent arrest, of potential steroid abuse. And for those who know anything about steroids, there is a quote unquote ro- roid rage type of thing that happens with people who are on steroids. And uh, based on, you know, I'm not accusing him of anything, but based on some of the details of the gym incident where he was arrested, there is some signs of some erratic behavior that could be attributed to that or other issues going on. And I don't know if you want to, I don't know if you want to have a part of that. Uh, I think, I think he could probably come in for a year and be a, a pretty good player for you. But I think that that is it at, at maximum, what you want a stopgap guy, a guy that, you know, that's it and uh, move on from there. I think, obviously, he's a big name. He's a successful name. He had a Pro Bowl year last year. Kind of surprisingly, in some ways, retired this year. And uh, he'll pro- he might get – might be Cincinnati, might be somewhere. But I, I don't – you know, I, I think the Bengals need to kind of filter out what they have, at least through spring, maybe the early parts of summer, and then say, you know what, maybe we need another body here. Maybe we need a guy who can – you know, stabilize things, if you will, for a year and then move on from there. I don't know, but that's, that's, I think, sounds like Scott, you and I are on the same page. Let's get out of here, Scott. I want to get out of here. I don't, you know, final thoughts. We talked about, Hey, final thoughts. I just want to get your, your thoughts on the, on the uh, FC Cincinnati being, being now a, an MLS team. And uh, you know, you live in that area. I know that means a lot to that area. Uh, any, I, I don't know if you're a fan of the the other football, but um, any thoughts on that? And I, I think that kind of means a lot for the greater Cincinnati area, right? Yeah, I think it's a, a pretty cool. I mean, it's uh, when I recall, I think the stadium is on the west side, so it's kind of a different venue than the other two. 
pro, major pro sports teams, which are downtown right there on the river. So it's kind of a different, uh, I, I think they tried to get it down there. There was a lot of discussion over the last few months about stadiums and contract, you know, stadium deals. And obviously Hamilton County uh, has had the history with the Paul Brown stadium. <laughs> that is something that many, I think in Hamilton County have complained about and even outsiders have looked at and said that was just a horrible deal. And so I think there was, and it was very interesting because MLS did not want to give the the FC Cincinnati a expansion franchise unless they got a new stadium. Well, no municipal municipality wanted to give this you know minor league soccer team a stadium or work with them on a stadium unless they were getting an MLS deal. So I believe the way it worked out was they. Uh, the soccer team was trying to, they were trying to work with you know, different locations, you know, inside like inner downtown kind of, uh, or the riverfront or the West end, the East. You know, and then what they ended up getting was this deal where, Hey, we'll give you the stadium where they got it past where we guarantee we'll build this for you. Assuming you get the, the expansion. And then, uh, once that got past the expansion, it, it seemed like it was something that was always kind of coming or it, they were a strong com- contender, uh, and I think one one very interesting thing about that is you look at this team really hasn't been around all that long. Last there's a for those who don't follow non football football uh, the the kicking version of football uh, there's a tournament every year. I think it's called the Lamar Hunt Trophy or something of that sort, where they take MLS teams and any pro team, so teams of like lesser leagues, which is the one that the Cincinnati team was in, and they just throw them on this big tournament. Last year, FC Cincinnati made it really far in this tournament. They beat a couple of the MLS teams on the way to, I forget what it was, semifinals or somewhere pretty far. You know, out of like 64 or whatever number of teams, they won quite a few games to get to this. And they drew huge crowds for as far as Major League Soccer goes, even you know, competing with Major League Soccer. And I think that was one of the things that MLS was able to see, like, wow, here's a team that draws fans. There, there seems to be an interest. They're winning games. They're winning prime clutch game, games they need to win. If they had lost the first game in that tournament, who knows? Maybe they would not have gotten this expansion bid. But it's interesting to see how there's a team in Cincinnati that has shown they're able to to win uh, you know, in the postseason or in a tournament. Uh-huh. Uh, something I'd, I'd like to see from the other two Cincinnati teams. Oh, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people would, but congratulations to the greater area of Cincinnati. Uh, They've been granted MLS status for FC Cincinnati and, um, you know, short time. And I think if I'm not mistaken, one of their PR guys, Jeff Birding used to, used to work for the Bengals um, and now has been a a spearheading figure for FC Cincinnati. And uh, so, so good for them. Good for the city of Cincinnati. I know uh, this Hopefully, FC Cincinnati doesn't provide the similar heartbreak that some of the other teams that this uh, this city is used to. But uh, you can get this show on iTunes, SoundCloud, CincyJungle.com. Uh, you can also get it on YouTube, and you can get in touch with us uh, via Twitter, at BengalsOBI, and via email, the OBNsetter at gmail.com. Scott, you have one more tidbit to talk about before we get out of here. Yes, and I know it's kind of running long, so I'll make this very quick. But something you'd mentioned earlier in the show was the office, uh, Toby and Dwight uh, talking about trains. So uh, I went back and found that clip. I haven't listened to it yet, but I in like the first half second, they show a train from like this very obscure oh, so movie, show. kind of see like a tiny bit of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I've been looking at this train, and I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what it is. I, I, I can tell based on the paint scheme, it's a regional short line. And I, I can tell that, and it looks like it is because it's only one engine. It looks like pulling. It's it looks like it's pulling probably a covered hopper car, open cop, hopper car, and then after that, I'm not quite sure because it kind of cuts off. If anyone can figure out what this is, because obviously they film it in California. I'm not very familiar with the California regional short lines. California is more Union Pacific, which is yellow. This thing's not yellow. It's not a BNSF or U or Santa Fe, which it kind of looks like at first, but it's not. If anyone knows what it is, feel free to tweet us. <laughs> And maybe we'll, we'll, we'll mention you next time. And on the air, okay, this was, uh, you know, so-and-so was able to figure out by watching this half-second clip that is, you know, 
it's obviously some sort of regional short line pulling uh, at least one hopper car. But after that, yeah, that's all I can really tell on that tiny little angle. Like obviously when they're filming the show, they weren't focused on trying to let people see what this train was. Please do let us know. <laughs> and uh, just to close up the show with the question of the night. And again, that is the, which Bengals logo do you like the best? Uh, on Twitter, at least, 28% says the Leaping Tiger, 32%, or excuse me, 33% says the Tiger Head, 28% says the B, the Striped B, 11% says other or none. So that's where we're at on that. And you can uh, let us know in the comments of our various media outlets about that. For the regional manager, Scott Schulte, I am the assistant to the regional manager, Anthony Cazenza. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, be be good to one, one another. Uh, there's a lot of negativity going around on, on a lot of different aspects. And uh, we just, just, just be good to one another. A lot of negativity going around. And uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't mean to be like, like peace, man, but that's kind of my take. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can get it on a number of different mediums, as we mentioned during the show. And uh, we'll see you next episode. For Scott Schultz, I'm Anthony Cazenza. We'll see you next time. Thanks.